I'm going to start things off in this channel easy by tackling something all of us millennials can agree on. We're old and tired. You kids get off my lawn! What do we get out of video games? Well, it differs from person to person. Some of us might enjoy the thrill of meeting an apparently impossible challenge and throwing ourselves against it again and again until we succeed. Other people might just be there for the pretty backgrounds and nice music. Almost every mainstream movie these days boils down to a simple three-act structure, starting with setup, rising action, and eventually catharsis, as outlined in Sid Field's classic 1978 instructional text, Screenwriting. Of course, the concept of catharsis and narrative structure go back way further than that, as you could probably guess from the fact that catharsis sounds un-American as hell. If Hollywood had really invented the concept, it would have been called the Mixplosion. However, movies and books and music are all different from video games in one very distinct way. They demand audience participation. It's not like an improv show where the troupe can just make jokes about having a cold audience and follow up with a sketch about boring audience members. If a video game has no player, nothing happens. And no one's happy. But not everyone can enjoy everything or participate in everything equally. At least, not until Bill Gates finishes installing the master control program in our neural nets. So, game designers are left with an unsolvable problem. Who do you design your games for? It can't be everyone, can it? And now we can finally get to... No, this is... I can't sustain this. And now we get to... No, I... I've gotta go casual. This is where we start talking about accessibility. Finally. Broadly speaking, accessibility research focuses on improving disabled persons' ability to use spaces, objects, and to participate in public life. Although the field of accessibility focuses on the access of people with specific, recognized disabilities, improving accessibility and working toward universal accessibility has benefits for anyone with situational limitations, such as people who are below average adult height, people with arthritis pain, and people with reduced lung capacity. Thus, the holy grail for accessibility advocates of all sorts is the concept of universal design. Now, brief aside, I should mention that I don't consider myself a disabled person, and I'm not an advocate for disabled persons. I have known and loved many differently abled, neurodivergent, and disabled people in my personal life. When discussing accessibility as a broad term, we should look to disabled persons themselves and platform them and listen to their voices, metaphorical or otherwise. But back to my main point. What I'm looking at today is the concept of and desirability of universal design in video games, and what that means in relation to the games I want to play. Now, the basic principles of universal design as an American concept can be traced back to research begun in 1949 at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Go, uh, problematic Illinoisians? Don't worry, I'll get to you someday, Chief Illinois. No, I won't. That concept of universal design and the various standards developed and implemented over the years related to universal design focuses primarily on accessibility of spaces, like buildings and gathering areas, or of products like dishware that are essential to most people's everyday lives. These principles have become more and more important as the United States and other countries have recognized the important contributions of disabled persons and faced aging population. Disabilities such as blindness, deafness, and reduced mobility are all more prevalent among elderly populations and the world is therefore in more need of universal accessibility and design than ever. However, these universal design principles focused on spaces and things don't necessarily help us to create a universally accessible video game, any more than they help us create a universally accessible movie or universally accessible comedy. Now, this is why I want to draw the distinction between accessibility, which is focused on ensuring access and accommodations for disabled persons, and universal design. 
there's a lot of overlap, but in my amateur reading of this, accessibility is a much more focused and developed field that can be, and is, applied to a wider variety of things, which is why we have ubiquitous subtitles and increasingly prevalent audio descriptions for deaf and blind people, respectively. Meanwhile, universal design is still largely constrained to things that aren't subject to petty little things like taste and the artistic experience. Major studios are bringing on accessibility consultants to ensure their teams are considering and addressing accessibility. As a result, we've started seeing a lot of games with options and inputs that improve access for people with certain disabilities such as colorblindness, blindness, deafness, and even some physical limitations. Examples of these include modes that use a different range of colors for the colorblind, audio descriptions for the blind, visualized sound and easily readable subtitles for the deaf, and allowing players to hold a button instead of mashing it. A video game disability consultant, Ian Hamilton, had this to say about the challenges and rewards of improving accessibility in games. Quote, There's a common set of misconceptions that people often have various combinations of. That accessibility is difficult, expensive, and involves diluting down your vision, harming the majority to suit the needs of less than 1% of the population who don't play games anyway. The one-handed control option in Uncharted 4 was used by one-third, i.e. millions, of their players. Subtitles were turned off by default in Assassin's Creed Origins and just over 60% of players turned them on. So Ubisoft had them on by default in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and 95% of players left them on. When they did the same in Far Cry New Dawn, 97% of players left them on. So what does that tell us? Accessibility options are improving the experiences and lives of more than just disabled people. Maybe they're even edging us towards some universal design principles in video games. But, as Ian Hamilton pointed out, people are very opinionated and worried about the impact of accessibility on video games as an art form. What about options that betray the artist's creative vision, you may ask? Is it a betrayal? of a visual designer to demand that their work be made accessible to the blind? Do audio designers suffer when a game can be enjoyed by the deaf? Is a game too easy when you don't have to mash a button to succeed? No, dummy! Corey Barlog, director of 2018's God of War, had this to say, quote, Accessibility does not exist in contradistinction to anyone's creative vision, but rather, it is an essential aspect of any experience you wish to be enjoyed by the greatest number of humans possible. In other words, an artist's vision is only good insofar as others can experience it. If an artist's vision isn't accessible to anyone other than the artist, it may still be art, but it can't be enjoyed and shared. It's essentially dead on arrival. So, with those basic ideas out of the way, at long last I can illustrate what I see as strides toward universal accessibility and design by looking at a pair of single-player action-adventure games I love that are, on the surface, very similar. They both invoke artistic visions of feudal Japan, and highlight the struggle of honorable characters who find themselves doing the unthinkable to survive and thrive. They both involve timing-based combat systems with katana parries, enemy stamina bars, and a protagonist who is completely invisible as long as they're standing near flowers. But one of them is a game I play to relax, to feel effortlessly powerful, even when my exhausted brain can't handle the stress of a pop quiz. And the other is a game I may never be able to beat. To me, one of them feels like it succeeds at accessibility for a wide, nearly universal audience, without compromising any artistic direction, while the other feels like an inaccessible masterpiece, gating me off from the music, nuanced writing, and stunning artistic design of its world with a demand that I get good. I'm a 32-year-old man, or man-child, with lightly medicated ADHD and a constant feed of stressful news. I'm not getting any more patient as I get older, and my reaction time and vision have decayed before me as I wither like a time-lapse jack-o'-lantern. I've played and enjoyed a wide variety of games, including all of the Soulsborne games from FromSoft. However, I've never beaten a Souls or Born without extensive help from friends. 
I'm lucky enough to have a husband who feels obligated to squeeze every last ounce of content from a Souls game, allowing me to lean on him in a pinch, for advice and for powering through the toughest of bosses. Instead of nervously peering around every corner for enemies, he and my other friends have given me the ability to see FromSoft's worlds for their beautiful, intricate design. Instead of only seeing snippets through the narrow peephole of fear and anxiety that the combat and traps inspire in me, then I hit Sekiro. Or maybe Sekiro hit me. There's no way for people to join me in jolly cooperation anymore. And so far I've spent the majority of my time in the game attacking a gosh dang horse. Basically, to succeed in Sekiro, you've got to learn the wind-up for every enemy's animation. Know whether it can be blocked or must be dodged. You hit that block button or dodge button in time to roll out of the way, step on their spear, block them if you have enough posture, or block at just the right time to parry and massively reduce their posture while preserving your own. Even with my limited attention span, I'm able to do that enough to make a little bit of progress. So, what's the problem? Well, the game is a pain in the butt. You lose half your money and XP whenever you die. Your deaths can almost randomly cause some helpful NPCs to cough and suffer instead of talking to you. Every single enemy can kill you if they gang up on you or you miss just the right attack hit at the right time. There are a million items in this game that do things like increase an obscure stat. Oh, and also the checkpoints, limited healing, and respawning enemies create this gated sense of progress that leaves me feeling like I've accomplished nothing if I take a few too many hits in any given fight. Oh, and also, apart from the vague suggestions and some visible paths and other subtle game design tricks, I never have any idea where I'm supposed to be or what might unlock the next area or boss fight. And the only way to explore in peace is to methodically kill everything in one go, knowing that that time and effort will be essentially undone whenever you stop to rest at a checkpoint. Contrast this with Bushido Blo- I, I mean Ghosts of Tsushima. Here, my healing is restricted only by how many people I'm killing. There's no consequence for dying as far as I've been able to tell. All the items are useful to some degree in every fight. The game is checkpointing constantly in the background. Any non-combat challenges are quick and can be retried instantly. And best of all, for my broken, old, exhausted brain, the game will literally point me in the direction I need to go to get things done. Now, there have been a lot of complaints that games don't challenge people anymore because of things like this, but frankly, I think that's a privileged as hell complaint mostly coming from people who believe that they're entitled to some sort of prestige for playing games goodly. And hell, those people can keep that prestige. I don't really think universal design requires that every single person in the world can get can every PlayStation trophy the developers dream up. So go ahead and gate your weird prestige gamer clique stuff for people who aren't playing on hard mode, for, you know, people who don't want to do Final Destination, Fox only. I, I don't care. But if you're a game designer, there's no reason to believe that giving people the option to make a game easier is taking anything away from your game for the players who want to challenge. Maybe it'll pose a challenge for you, the developer, but the payoff far outweighs the effort. Both Sekiro and Ghost of Tsushima are excellent games that teach players how to play them with their mechanics. The problem is that Sekiro leans heavily on punishing players, which causes some people like myself to stress the heck out, while Ghost manages to teach purely through positive reinforcement. In other words, Sekiro is the nun with a ruler, and Ghost is the hippie parent who gives their kid extra allowance for good grades. When the only thing you're learning is how to play the game you bought, doesn't it make sense to forego the strict tutelage and just focus on positive reinforcement? This video's too long already, and I want to have a productive point, so here's my humble suggestion to cap it all off. Keep giving players options. Sid Meier famously described a video game as a series of interesting choices. In my opinion, as a human being who has created some art, and also from a purely financial perspective, those choices should be available to everyone, regardless of sex, gender, race, orientation, or disability. And you can make your games even more interesting by providing even more choices. Use your artistic vision to guide your default settings, sure, but let every player know that there's a way to make your experience less stressful so they can get through it. 
give us difficulty levels so easy they make the game trivial, along with difficulty levels hard enough for your hardcore fans to brag about how impossible it is. Implement a toggle for every option that someone claims makes the game too hard or too easy. Or just straight up let us cheat. Add a god mode, like Control. Or like in the new Final Fantasy HD remasters. Those are both games with cheat modes I've never used, out of stubborn pride. Same thing with easy or even normal difficulty level in Ghost of Tsushima. I don't need to actually use them to advocate for them, or to be glad that they're there. I've had half a dozen times where I've started up one of these games, thought, oh god, will I be able to beat this? And then thought, I can always just skip over it if it's really too tough. Will someone get butthurt and claim these options undermine the whole game by letting noobs or... What do kids call it these days? Uh, scrub lords? I don't know. Help me out in the comments, please. Anyway, don't listen to anyone that says having the option to cheat in a single-player game makes their lives worse. That's like arguing that gay marriage makes straight marriages less sacred. In both cases, the complainers can fix their own problems by just not using the thing they don't like. So, it's not really a relevant complaint to anyone, is it? Okay. Final thought, and final message for game developers making these single-player games that I love and that I want to love. If your goal is for the most people possible to enjoy your game, listen to Cory Barlog and give players choices. Give us easy mode, and give us god mode. Let us cheat. And that'll be the first step for universal design in gaming. Thank you. Shoot. Uh, control. Control is the perfect game. I should have just said play control. Sorry, ignore this whole video. Anyway, thanks for tagging along with me on this, my first experiment in video essay. My goal with this channel is to organize and share my thoughts in a succinct and hopefully watchable, enjoyable way. I'd like just about anyone, except Nazis, to be able to enjoy my work. So, if you want to see more of this, please like, subscribe, and maybe even comment. If you didn't like it, sorry. I'm, I'm actually, no, seriously, I'm sorry. I don't want to waste anyone's time. I am trying to be informative and entertaining, uh, and the greatest crime is wasting your time. So, if you enjoyed it, thank you for being here with me. If you didn't, I'm sorry. I'm sure I'll hear all about it. But regardless, thank you for taking the time. I just wanted to end this video with a quick shout out to the uh, authors of this game accessibility study from 2011 that did a great job of breaking down sort of the state of gaming accessibility and sort of what goes into uh, thoughts about gaming accessibility, at least back in 2010, a uh, really broad study that had a lot of insight, um, as well as some of the other resources dedicated to disabled gamers, uh, and I especially wanted to thank the authors of the articles that I relied on for quotes, including this Wall Street, or this Washington Post article by Grant Stoner, a uh, huge help with the quotes from Ian Hamilton, and, uh, there were many articles discussing Cory Barlog's uh, views on accessibility, and this was the one that I used. Uh, so thank you to Ewan Moore, or Ewan Moore, sorry I don't know how to pronounce that, um, for this article on Unilad. And uh, thank you all for joining me today. I, I know it may be a little rough, I'm still sort of learning video editing, and I appreciate you writing this out with me.